evening's <laughs> book launch. Uh, the book being launched this evening is Dr. Rakesh Mohan's book, Growth with Financial Stability, Central Banking in an Emerging Market, published by Oxford University Press. This evening's function is being brought to you jointly by OUP, ICREA, and Aspen Institute. I would now like to invite Mrs. Rasika Mohan to sing the invocation to Saraswati. <clears throat> Padma Patra Vishalakshi Padma Kesara Varnini Nityam Padma Laya Devi Samantatu Saraswati Sharadindu Vikasa Mandahasini Puradindivar Lochana Bhiranam Aravindasana Sundari Mupasye Sharada Sharadam Bhoja Vadana Vadanam Bhoja Sarvada Sarvada Smakam Sannidhi Sannidhim Kriya Thank you. I will now call upon Mr. Manzar Khan, Managing Director of Oxford University Press, to say a few words, please. Uh, eminent panelists, author, very distinguished guests, it's indeed a great privilege and pleasure for me to welcome all of you this evening for the launch of Dr. Rakesh Mohan's new book. I have... Uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan's new book, Growth with Financial Stability, Central Banking in an Emerging Market, um, it has been published by Oxford University Press. Uh, this book looks at how India weathered the last financial crisis and the factors that contributed to it. I'm sure the author and the panelists will throw more light on the book later on. We are privileged to have the presence of this August panel to discuss the book. I extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, Deputy Chairman, Planning Commission. Dr. C. Rangarajan, Chairman, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Dr. Bimal Jalan, Eminent Economist and former Governor, RBI. As his earlier work, Monetary Policy in a Globalized World, which I remember was released here in 2009, it was a runaway success. It did extremely well in the hardback. We converted that into a paperback, which has also done extremely well. And I think that's due to Dr. Mohan's insider view of the working of the financial system in India, which provides a unique and fascinating perspective. This book could not be more timely, as we all know that the world is going through what is, appears to be another economic crisis. And I congratulate the author for working on this relentlessly with our editors, especially during a personal, a period of personal trauma. I think it's highly creditable that Rakesh took time out to pay attention to, to the uh, editing of the book, which has really helped his, it to become up to date and relevant as far as possible. I believe there could be ne no better forum for its release and discussion than this one. We have a distinguished panel of policymakers and planners and an equally informed audience. I can proudly say that Oxford University Press India's economics list has always published the best and the brightest on the Indian economy. And I can say very proudly that all the four gentlemen have published with Oxford University Press sitting here this evening, among so many others in the audience. We pride ourselves on our relevant and forward-looking publishing program. The book, Growth and Financial Stability, exemplifies this trait. 
We are delighted to publish Rakesh's book and look forward to its reception by both scholars and students of the Indian economy and our policy makers. I can assure Dr. Rakesh Mohan, we look forward to receiving his next manuscript. I'm sure you'll get time when you go to Yale. Let me conclude personally by, by personally thanking the Aspen Institute and ICRIA for their support in jointly hosting this function. Thank you. I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Anwarul Hoda, Chair Professor of ICRIA's State Policy and WTO Research Program, and also member of the Governing Board of ICRIA, to say a few words. <coughs> I am delighted and honored to uh, represent a career at this uh, 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 launch of uh, yet another book uh, by uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan, eminent public servant and a scholar. Although this uh, brilliant analysis purports to only explore the evolving roles of fiscal, monetary and financial policies in India, in fact it reviews India's development story in the post-independence era. One of the messages that comes out of the book is that India was relatively unaffected by the Asian and the North Atlantic financial crises, mainly because of the approach of conscious gradualism, gradualism adopted towards reform in the financial sector. From time to time, <coughs> India has been the subject or object or butt of derision or derisive remarks by, international, by the international financial community for not being bold enough and its policies have always proven correct. In Latin America, in Southeast Asia, and in the USA and Europe more recently. During the Asian financial crisis, when our policymakers were claiming credit for avoiding the predicament, the criticism that I heard in Delhi was that it was like a half-starved person boasting that he did not have hypertension. I hope uh, uh, Rakesh's book will enable uh, people to have a saner view uh, and a more constructive view of how we managed everything as we did. The world has now recognized India's achievement in coming out unscathed from the global and regional financial crises. Rakesh has attempted to explain why India's financial sector has remained resilient. In his own words, Rakesh has set out to provide an understanding of India's macroeconomic, fiscal, monetary, and financial policies as they have evolved over the years. The review of the record of India's economic growth and development and the dealing with the banking and financial market development that underpinned the process he has delineated the progress that has been made in, the, in banking, especially after the economic reforms at the turn of the 90s, and the infusion of market orientation in the sector. He has described the far-reaching changes in the foreign exchange market, the adoption of current account convertibility, and the subsequent steps towards liberalization of the capital account transactions. In monetary policy, he gives an account of how, in, in India, the issue of large, growing, volatile flows were handled while maintaining low inflation, sustained growth, along with financial stability. The book 
is going to be very valuable for policy makers, makers and scholars alike because it touches on all the issues that have come to the fore during the recent crisis such as the appropriateness of light touch financial sector regulation, the need for monetary policy to move away from the narrow price stability inflation targeting objectives. No less illuminating is the analysis of the recent financial crisis, its causes and consequences. There is a chapter on the way ahead for Indian reforms. The first generation reforms unleash the private sector. The second, in his view, should empower the public sector for delivery of public goods and services. He identifies four areas for focused attention, agricultural development, urban development, human resource development, and the management of public services. I wish he had dealt more uh, elaborately with the last subject, that is the management of public services, because that is bound to uh, uh, the, the recommendations that he gives, uh, uh, is bound to evoke uh, some uh, sort of uh, thinking and reaction. I would like to stop here. So the, uh, and not get in between the audience and the very distinguished group of people who, who are here uh, to, to have discussions in the book. Thank you. Well, we now come to the part of the program where we'll have the release of the book. So I would request uh, Mr. Khan and Professor Huda, Huda to please come up for the release. And, um, and I would request Sri Montek Singh Aluwalia to release the book for us. Thank you. <laughs> I would now request Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia to say a few words, please. Um, Rakesh, uh, Manza, Anwar, friends. Well, first of all, let me begin by congratulating Rakesh for actually, first of all, producing uh, what is a really impressive volume. Um, I can't actually say that I've read the book, but I've kind of gone through it and I know. Uh, I, I know that coming from someone who was very much in the, in the center of uh, both macro management and monetary management, depending on the times, certainly a, uh, an insider's account, and I actually would recommend it to uh, everybody, but especially to students. I think it's a, one advantage of uh, actually writing a book, even if it's based on earlier pieces, uh, He's written it in, in a capacity where, which is now academic. So it has all the gravitas that goes with, the, that is expected of people who teach. Uh, and I'm sure it will be read by people who will subject it to a great deal of scrutiny. So actually, we to have a nice informal discussion. Uh, it was agreed that uh, I would encourage uh, Dr. Rangarajan and Bimal here to have a conversation. I don't know if you... Uh, uh, I mean, if somebody wants to interfere and intervene in the conversation, since there is no opportunity for audience, if you allow me the discretion, um, I will allow in the middle of the conversation odd bits of input from uh, the audience. I mean, the audience are all friends of yours, and I know that <laughs> they've gone through 
the events described in this chapter with you and probably would want to have a part of the action. So with those words, let me, let me begin by asking Dr. Rangarajan uh, to kick off the conversation. And let me provoke you a little bit. You know, whenever I, I mean, one of the things about central bankers is that, you know, they're, they're very cautious people. I mean, you know, whenever you read any central bank statement, it is almost impossible to disagree with anything in it, because it's a, it's a model of balance, you know, must sort of promote growth and also stability. Of course, in India, uh, typically the central banks like to believe that they're, they are involved in promoting growth in the context of monetary stability while keeping an eye on income distribution and mindful of the need to promote employment and financial inclusion and everything. So the issue really is that if you look, look at uh, the developments uh, how would you say, uh, what are the difficult issues that uh, Rakesh is picking on here uh, where, you know, you might say interesting statements where people could disagree as opposed to a very authoritative account of actually what we did. I mean, it's quite clear that for somebody who was in the institution, it would be other than Venu Reddy, who's also written about the same events. And by the way, students, it would be a good idea for your students to compare your book, compare and contrast Rakesh Mohan with Venu Reddy to see, are you, are you telling things differently? So let me, let me provoke you uh, to comment on that. So uh, you're not really provoking me. Uh, um, I, I didn't quite understand when it said in conversation with, I do not know what, what that really uh, means. Uh, one can always make some comments on the book uh, and then uh, probably uh, touch on what you say. Um, uh, let me at the outset uh, compliment and congratulate uh, Rakesh uh, on a very fine volume, fine collection of uh, essays. Uh, I must say that each article or each essay, apart from being intellectually stimulating, is also a mine of uh, information. And uh, these uh, book these articles cover a wide range uh, from international financial or economic crisis uh, to issues in monetary policy, central banking in its various dimensions, economic growth, uh, financial sector development, and financial stability. Uh, it's, a, it's a large and a wide uh, coverage, and I must uh, let me congratulate you once again on a very, very thought-provoking uh, set of articles. Now, when I read the book, and um, um, because these are articles which were being published earlier, some of them I had read uh, even at the time at which they were published, uh, there, are, there is at least one point on which I would like to start, and that is on what, what are the lessons that we have learned from the international uh, financial crisis of 2008. Uh, in a sense, yes, we have handled that uh, situation well. Um, uh, in some ways, India is also insulated uh, from the rest of the world, uh, and it is not so open in that sense as far as the uh, integration with the rest of the world is concerned, particularly in the financial uh, sector. What, what are the lessons from the international financial crisis? A, from the point of view of regulation, and B, from the point of view of monetary policy. I think that's where some questions will arise, whether um, uh, in what direction monetary policy should be moving. The most glaring thing that stands out in the episode uh, was the regulatory failure. And the regulatory failure was of two types. First, regulation was very weak in relation to several sectors. In some sectors, regulation was not at all present. Uh, the light touch approach uh, extended to uh, sectors like investment banks, hedge funds, and rating agencies. The second regulatory failure was uh, an inadequate understanding by the central banks themselves of some of the derivative uh, products. Uh, there was, I, in my view, a mismatch between financial innovation and the ability of the central banks to regulate. Um, the various, uh, even if you look at the subprime mortgage uh, market uh, crisis, the various arrangements that, are, uh, that were beneath the uh, bank's 
uh, lending uh, were not very clear until the, actually the crisis uh, broke out. So there, the, these are the two major uh, failures on the regulatory side. Now we know what we want to do. Uh, there is a certain degree of consensus on what needs to be done on the regulatory side. Um, one, it should cover all segments of the economy, uh, all segments of the financial sector, so that there is no regulatory arbitrage. Uh, the uh, systemically important institutions need special treatment, uh, both in terms of uh, increased prudential norms or better, uh, stronger prudential norms, and uh, uh, the discouraging uh, leverage and so on and so forth. Now, there is a controversy that is going on, to which I must refer, that whether the crisis that erupted in 2008 was the result of regulatory failure or monetary policy failure. An understanding of that will give us some insights into what needs to be done on monetary policy. But those who say that it is a failure of monetary policy say that the period of the great moderation when growth rate was high and in inflation was low, resulted in low interest rates, which created a situation in which risk taking was becoming easier and the risk premiums were underestimated. On the other hand, those who say it is a regulatory failure point to the lax supervision and regulation, uh, which led to regulatory arbitrage and also uh, to inadequate attention to origination of loans and so on. And those who think that monetary policy is not the primary, uh, does not bear the primary responsibility, also say that at best it played a facilitating role because of the low interest rate. Now the one question that arises is, and I think um, Rakesh refers to it, is what is the role of monetary policy in the context of asset uh, prices? Where the asset price bubbles can happen even in a period in which the prices or the generally indicated prices remain stable. To, let the, uh, to clean up after the burst is a policy that has cost these uh, developed economies uh, greatly. But my own impression at this particular point is uh, that what happened in the United States and in the Western world is primarily due to the regulatory uh, failure. Uh, the failure of monetary policy, in my view, is um, in being accommodative. It is um, much more the responsibility for uh, the failure lies with the uh, regulatory um, lapses. Now, it is in this context an interesting question that arises, and it was also referred to, whether the narrow focus of uh, monetary policy on price stability has led to this uh, problem. Now, I do not think that's the right interpretation. I, I believe that Rakesh has a slightly different uh, view on this. But my, my, my own view is that if you look at the countries which have not had the problems, uh, they also have price stability as the main objective. If you look at it, United States to the governor of the Bank of uh, Canada and ask him whether uh, he, would make, he would make a change. He said, no. I mean, uh, to us, inflation targeting is helpless. And in fact, what it really means is that interest rates cannot also be pushed below what is their sustainable level. And that is also part of the way in which inflation targeting has to be interpreted. So I would say that when it comes to the developing economies particularly, that can be multiple objectives. Monetary policy is one instrument, and like any other instrument of economic policy, it can have multiple objectives. But if you have multiple objectives, you must also have a hierarchy of objectives. Otherwise, it will only result in confusion. And in my view, that in developing economies, price stability, is the dominant objective of monetary uh, policy. I think this is 
uh, in, in the more recent period. Uh, we are seeing it in India. Everybody looks to the central bank of the country for taming uh, inflation because price stability happens to be one of the primary objectives and the dominant objective of monetary policy. It does not necessarily mean the others are excluded, but I, I believe that what we really need to look at is the hierarchy of objectives, and in the hierarchy of objectives, I believe price stability is important. Let me make one more comment, one more uh, point, and then stop there. In this reflection on the impact of the international financial crisis, there is also a tendency to become extremely conservative too. Uh, the, uh, it is true that there were excesses in the U.S. system. But financial innovation is also extremely uh, important. In, it is particularly true in developing economies like ours. I think we should not draw The stage at which we are is very different from the, the stage at which some of these countries like the United States were. Our, we are growing fast. New sectors are coming in. Financing of the new sectors like infrastructure need innovative ways of looking at it. And therefore, we should not, uh, we should be careful not to become so conservative as to come in the way of innovations. Uh, the too little regulation can result in financial instability, but too much of it can also impede innovation. And therefore, I plead that there's a thin line between regulation and control. And let us guard ourselves from slipping into, from regulation into, into, into control. Finally, I say that policymakers need to strike a proper balance between innovation, which is needed to accelerate economic growth, and regulation, which is needed for stability. He calls his book Growth and Stability. And I would say growth and stability requires a proper compromise between innovation and regulation. Thank you, uh, thank you, Montague. Uh, let me start by saying a word about the book and uh, what distinguishes this book from a lot that has been written on the financial system, stability. You know, this has been a topic in the last five, seven years where you've, I think, uh, more than probably 30 books are available. But what distinguishes this book is uh, really two things. One, the author. I don't think, I cannot, I was recalling this as I was going through the pages of any other person, and he's a friend, he has been a colleague, and uh, I have, he has disagreed with me, and I have disagreed with him, and we have fought over issues of policy issues, that's not important. But what distinguishes the, uh, the author, Rakesh, of this book, and what he has brought together is spread over which were the articles and pieces which were spread over a few years. He is just imagine his experience in the Ministry of Finance, in the fiscal sector, or the financial policy making sector. Then you of course know about his central banking experience, one of the longest experience. But that is professional career. Then look at him. He has been a, one of the India's most prominent researchers. He academically one of the most distinguished persons in economics, not necessarily financial economics, but on economics in general, development economics and so on. You have a person who is now at Yale, Stanford, <clears throat> I don't know how many places he has taught to, but above all, above all, I mean here is somebody with financial experience, with policy making experience, with central banking experience, with academic achievements and scholastic excellence. Internationally, you, you name an organization, you name a group, 
which deals with international issues, and you find that Rakesh Mohan has been associated with it. I, even I didn't recall until I read this book. You uh, IMF, World Bank, G20, ADB. <laughs> I was surprised that he is also you know, part of ADB. Then I was looking at something. There is a working group on something, International Financial Order Chairman, Rakesh Mohan. And, and uh, any conference anywhere. So just combine all this. You know, you would have need, needed about 20 individuals of excellence to have done all the kind of background that was prepared all this so. And I think that's one of the most important things to distinguish it. Then, of course, in all the book itself, the canvas is very large and very broad. And it uh, deals, it calls itself emerging economies and central banking. It goes very beyond, I think, the genes of growth. And what I also uh, had to skip over was the statistical detail that is provided with an excellent analytical uh, framework. I'm sure Fisha here would have liked that because uh, she herself is the originator of the world total productivity. Do I might well call it right on the industrial sector? The most recent piece of work was done by her in the 70s, she, uh, she would have seen the amount of work that she had also brought from there. Academicians, students, policy makers, and everybody else. Whatever you want to know, it is there. If you want to see statistics of India's growth between 70 and 80, you will find it here, <laughs> which has nothing to do with financial crisis and so on. So, Rakesh, really, I mean what I say, and we have made a contribution to the literature which is available on this subject and not only in the academic circles, but internationally also, I'm sure, it would find an echo. Now, on the subject, uh, I think uh, Rangarajan has said, uh, if, you know, all that needed to be said on the role of monetary policy, innovation, and uh, the choice between stability, growth, and so on. The point to remember is that the trade-offs and choices uh, differ from time to time. There is, you know, there is, everybody says growth, and price stability. One year ago, I mean, some of our policymakers, I mean, you know, I mean, that the growth is important, if you do something on inflation, growth would be there. Now that trade-off has changed. You want to do inflation and not necessarily worry about growth. So similarly with monetary policy, that if uh, ultimately this is an instrument of policy, when you therefore, you have to see what is the need of the country wherever you are working or whichever country is inside and uh, not slogan mongering or not orthodoxy or not following and I think this is extremely important between you can innovate when there is time but if you are in a crisis, if you have a problem then you have to do what is necessary to be done and what the trade-offs. There are always trade-offs between everything. I mean, should you drive a 40 kilometer or 30 kilometer, should you walk in the rain or not in the rain? But it depends, you know, on the situation. And Rangaratin has given a very fair account of what monetary policy can do and cannot do. So I don't want to deal with that. But with your permission, okay, I'll talk about something different, slightly different. I mean, as we talk about regulation, banking and all the rest of it, where Rangarajan has touched upon some crucial issues. The fact, what is the fact today? You are facing another crisis. And what is that crisis? Which has nothing to do with banks, which has nothing to do with the regulatory system, it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, whether you should have capital adequacy, you shouldn't have capital adequacy, you should have asset bubble, you shouldn't have asset bubble, what should you have? This is a sovereign crisis. That crisis, the 2008 crisis, the financial crisis, was at the banking level, Lehman Brothers died, so there so was a sovereign to rescue it. What is it today? Now, look at the, when we say about the regulations and something, or something could prevent crisis. You can't prevent crisis. What is happening today? And that's what I used, that you have the sovereign. You look at Europe. All of them have fiscal deficit target. All of them have debt to GDP target. But nobody bothered because they are sovereign. They have the same exchange rate, so there's one instrument gone. They are sovereign countries, so nothing can be done. 
and you have the United States of America. The death is not one year episode, suddenly it happened, or suddenly you had a uh, boom or bust. It has been gathering steam, it has been there. Fiscal, we were all written about fiscal <coughs> deficit being financed, current account deficit being financed, all abroad, and now suddenly you face it because the US Congress put its foot down. Well, that was a political issue, political, political turmoil. I mean, this kind of politics, if it happens anywhere, you can't run any policy. But anyway, now, so the new issues which are emerging are completely independent of 2008. And I think we should apply our mind that why is the world, I mean, facing the kind of crisis which is also financial. Emerging market, which has affected you, which has affected the rest of the world, how do you handle it? So I have, I, what I believe, feel, and in this very distinguished audience, and uh, Montek and uh, our leaders, other leaders here, that you have to bring it to the table. What you need is a Bretton Woods again. There is no global financial framework. You have a euro which controls exchange, the same exchange rate for everybody. Then you have flexible exchange rates. Then you have Band, exchange rates in the band, like, uh, like China. Now one complains about the other, the other complains about somebody else. So what you need is, this is exchange rate. Exchange rate is erratic now. Management, we may manage, we do something, we, somebody else does it. You know, so exchange rate is not there. Interest rates, you know, you have liquidated trap, inflation, the interest rate is close to zero, zero, then you want to increase investment, who would invest, savings, what, what do you do, so you borrow, whatever you do. There are no international rules of the game. The IMF, World Bank, they have they've lost the plot. I mean, they have, you know, the mandate that they have. What does IMF do today? It went to the developed countries, which has nothing to do with either their balance of payments, or the debt service, uh, debt service ratio. When they were handling developing countries, was a different episode. You have the ECB with the guarantee, with buying bonds. So the whole world is in turmoil. I will want to raise this issue here that let us not, that it is that we have gone beyond what you would have regarded as a financial crisis which is either lack of regulation or too much regulation. It is the, the other factor I want to men just mention is that what has happened in the financial world is complete disassociation with the real world. Finance affects the real world. Real world does not affect finance. I mean, US, Europe, for the last four or five years have had an average rate of growth of 1.5%. And yet they could borrow anything they want. Yet they could do whatever they want. Yet they could have a compensation of billions of dollars. But if, uh, if, the, but finance, if the finance system didn't work, it's affected, everything goes down in employment, everybody is going, you know, you have uh, London you know, <laughs> breaking out into riots. This is a very fundamental problem and I think we have to go beyond the conventional model of banking, conventional model of regulation, conventional monetary policy and that it is our role as an emerging market that we have to bring it to the table and I would suggest that the world has to get together, take some view on what are the rules of the game when I am buying dollars and selling rupees or the other way around. The Bretton Woods was that part. Then you had Plaza Accord. Now everything is, you know, the end of history. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, General. I mean, I've certainly raised uh, a lot of food for thought being uh, flung at the audience. Um, I wonder if I can invite one or two people uh, to raise some comments. And the reason I say that is, you know, Rakesh is going to speak uh, <coughs> after all this. And I think it would be nice if, since we all think it, you know, we've all said, A, what a great guy he is, and what a wonderful book this is. And by the way, I said that right at the beginning. I do think, you know, it's pretty comprehensive. <laughs> I think we should end, we should use this occasion to fling a few contentious sort of points at him and let him respond. I'm sure the answers are there in the book. I just haven't had the time to read all of it. 
I have a few questions that I can ask. Some have been raised by Dr. Rangaraj and Bimal, but I thought we'd give the audience an opportunity. Uh, now, it's not fair in the sense that they haven't read the book, but I think they're allowed to ask questions. TN9N. Yes, I thought your question Well, no, I, I said, look, uh, this is an audience of friends, and I think we can't be conducting this just by making speeches. So, TN, what's your question? Thank you, Monte. Um, Rakesh's book is called Growth with Financial Stability. And without wanting to be facile, I want to ask a question, which is, can you have financial stability without growth? Uh, the point that Bimal made uh, is really that the uh, main Western economies really have not had growth, and then they've leaned on the financial system to engineer things to try and generate some growth, and they've gone to the mess of the consequence. So if you don't have the real economy growing, you're not going to be, at some point, you're going to lose financial stability. And is that a valid point? Thank you. That's a good, that's a nice, punchily put thing. Yes? Uh, thank you, Mantik. My name is Krishan Rana. I have a very simple question. Since Rakesh's book has been described by Bimal Jalan as a kind of Kamdhenu, I am allowed perhaps <laughs> to ask a stupid question. And my stupid question is, uh, Will India ever manage to have a sovereign wealth fund or will, it, or will the lack of appetite for risk make it impossible for India to have a sovereign wealth fund? Thanks. Nice punchy sort of question there. <laughs> Sujit, uh, yes, of course. Well, let me try and um, attempt to answer Bimal's question. Um, you don't want uh, Rakesh to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's probably answered in the book, I hope it is. But no, I, I, think, I think what you've raised uh, or phrased what is very, very relevant. And why is the system broke? And the system is broke because some people uh, didn't play by the rules. Phrased differently. It is the case that all of us in the world developed countries and developing countries have to come to grips with the notion that the developing countries are for various reasons growing much faster than the developed countries. They have taken the jobs away and that is what is at the center of all of this angst whether it is in Greece or whether it is in the US or whether it is in Germany. Basically, one example of how the jobs have been taken away. Now, when Singapore didn't play by the rules of the game, all of us didn't care. There are 20 people there and maybe m many more sheep. But when a country, <laughs> when, and when, when Korea doesn't play by the rules of the game, we also didn't care. When Japan didn't play by the rules of the game, as some people thought, and you mentioned the Plaza Agreement, it really didn't matter. When a country that has 900 million workers, whose average wage, <coughs> incidentally, is less than the wage of an Indian in dollar terms, and their productivity is two and a half to three times higher than Indians, that's when you have a problem. And that's what's a cause, if you want to look at a cause, as to why the whole system is broken. Thanks, Sujit. I think we have a gentleman there wanted to ask a question. Yeah, um, I think I'm a little bit excited because uh, I recall that uh, if uh, I had lived in 1936 and uh, had been when the general theory of Keynes was launched, I would have been this excited because it just came after a crisis like the one we've just had. And uh, what is more exciting to me is the fact that I recall that uh, a year before the launching of that book, Keynes had, in a letter to Bernard Shaw, said he was writing a book, a textbook on economics that was going to revolutionize the way the world thinks about economic matters. So what I want to ask uh, the author, uh, Dr. Rakesh, is can you tell me now something, one thing that goes away from mainstream thought? You know, Keynes was able to move away from classical economic thought. He went away from what everybody assumed was the way to solve the crisis. He went away from what everybody thought was what was workable at the time. And he said the 
problem, the solution lay on the side of demand. He pointed his simple thesis and it worked. It still works, even though some may not accept it. So I would like you to just tell me one thing that, as a student, I can go into that book and see which is different from what mainstream economics is saying, because mainstream economics seems to be failing. Thank you. You know, uh, one way of looking at uh, what's been happening in the last five years uh, is that, uh, possibly, is that the uh, developed countries were going on, uh, you know, consuming more and more, leading to high levels of consumption, high quality life, uh, more environmental degradation. But in the process, everything was becoming costlier and costlier, and more and more difficult to sustain, more and more difficult to afford. On the other hand, you, had country, you have countries like India and China who are actually producing more, and uh, uh, while the values there have been rising and going through the roof, uh, things have remained low here. Now, this is unsustainable, and I think a whole lot of rebalancing is going on in the world, where you know uh, things in the Western and the developed world are getting priced down, and things in the in countries like Asia, like China and India are actually getting priced more correctly this might lead to a whole amount of re global rebalancing i don't know how it would impact financial stability of the entire international uh, financial system and whether or not uh, this is true if it is going to happen how this whole turmoil will get uh, settled at some point well i think uh, maybe uh, this is going to be a trying to sum up a conversation, because I really hope that uh, we'll hear from you uh, reactions on some points. So while I'm sure that you yourself have made notes of what you want to react to, I thought I'd try to put this discussion in a certain context. First of all, and it's a tribute to the book, it's a very nice chapter on the global financial crisis. I mean, as the crisis was unwinding, there were lots and lots of books that were written. I think this thing does summarize, and it will stay for some time, because it has, A, it has a, it's a pretty good account, but I think Rakesh has a, a, a direct involvement uh, in the post-crisis period, which I think Bimal alluded to, because he was the co-chair uh, with Canada. India and Canada co-chaired a G20 working group on the whole issue of regulation. So the points that Dr. Rangarajan talked about, you know, was it a regulatory failure and so on. I'm kind of less interested in looking back, uh, uh, you know, on that specific analysis, but it has very, it's great relevance to the future. So, I mean, they, they were asked to set up a group. Uh, they, they did set up a group, which he co-chaired with Tiff McLean, that's mentioned somewhere in the book, on, you know, the new international regulatory structure. So that's that's a global G20 um, effort, and you've got the co-chair of it writing this book, so best person. Other, Tiff McClellan is here next week, so maybe I'm going to ask him whether he agrees with what you say. But I think it would be very useful to get a sense. An answer to this question, which actually hasn't been specifically raised, everybody knows that there were... There was an aspect of regulatory failure. Dr. Rangarajan drew attention to that. There is this G20 group. There's the Financial Stability Board, which we've now joined, the emerging market countries. I think one question that keeps coming up is that are these new international regulations that are being proposed, are they going to be good for developing countries or not? And you know, as always happens, uh, uh, a sort of dissenting voices are being heard. And I've certainly received emails from various people saying we should be very wary about accepting the new global consensus on financial regulations. So my first question is that as Indian co-chair of this international effort, what do you think about this side of the picture? That uh, is the world being pushed into a, a structure of financial regulation which may make a lot of sense for the US and may make a lot of sense for Europe, but actually is not going to be appropriate for us. I mean, generally a relevant question. Incidentally, it's, I mean, that's about the international. I, personally, I'm much more interested on the Indian side, and most of the book is really about India, but you, know, you may want to respond to many of the global issues 
uh, that have been raised. On the Indian side, I think there are two or three things which you deal with actually quite clearly, and I happen to agree with one of the issues there is the whole Indian approach to capital account opening. And I think it's very, I mean, it's quite clear that we, we definitely opened the capital account, but we did it very cautiously. And I think when that was done, we were hugely criticized. Uh, I think Rakesh rightly says that we were right to be cautious, and I mean, I agree with that. Uh, and I think in a way, um, many people at that time uh, was, was saying that, you know, trying to manage the exchange rate, preventing it from appreciating, uh, was a bad idea. I think the public opinion, international opinion, has actually changed quite a bit. But given, given where we stand now, I think Dr. Rangarajan was very clear in saying that just because there was a problem, uh, we should not, at least I read you, sir, I say, that we should not stop moving forward because those guys were at one end of the spectrum. We are much closer to the other end of the spectrum. There is, however, in the Indian uh, debate scene, whatever, a lot of people saying, aha, we've learned some phenomenal things from this crisis and all this capital account opening up, liberalization, this is the road to hell and so forth. And we would be well advised, some would say, even to dismantle what we've done. I, I, I mean, I, it would be very interesting to get your view to all, for all the people here. Do you share the view that the, the, the general principle that we should continue to open up, though of course with caution, is correct? Or do you think that uh, we've done about enough now and we should really... Uh, give, it a, give it a miss for quite a few years. I think that's an important issue. Um, another issue which actually I didn't find discussed uh, a lot, but maybe it's there and I haven't uh, spotted it. You know, people who look at the Indian financial system uh, constantly raise the question that can a public sector dominated banking system actually achieve the objective of allocating capital most efficiently for a rapidly growing, growing economy. Uh, I personally would be quite interested to hear your reflections on that. Uh, and I think that's a very critical issue because the truth of the matter is that although we've introduced competition a little bit, uh, but not really all that much. I mean, the share of the public sector banking system, the share of the public sector banks in India's banking system is still 80% maybe 75. 70. 70 now? Okay, well, that's not bad. Okay, that's a certain problem. <laughs> uh, so the issue really is, uh, looking 10 years ahead, and this is very relevant for people in the planning commission, we should be looking 10 years ahead. What is, is it reasonable to say that 10 years from now, 70% should become 50%? Yes. And if it is reasonable to say 70% should become 50%, what do you think bank licensing policy should be? Uh, and when? And should that be done by greater liberalization of licenses to foreign banks or greater liberalization of new entrants in Indian private banks? Uh, I mean, I'm asking questions. You shouldn't presume from the question what my answer would be. Uh, but I think it's a very crucial issue. And it's, it's a crucial issue for one more reason. And that is that if the government is hesitant about raising uh, or lowering the equity in uh, public sector banks below 51%, which is clearly at the moment the political assessment that we cannot do that. I think Bimal at one stage had suggested, maybe I'm getting it wrong, that we could still control, which is true, and we can control these banks uh, and lower below 51. What would happen is that all the public sector rules for employees would no longer apply. So the only people actually protected by not going below 51% is essentially all the contractual relations that determine the relationship between the bank and the employee. You would still control the bank. But you know, if we can't do that, uh, then does it not constrain uh, the ability of the public sector to expand as rapidly as ho the hopeful 9% that we are aiming at uh, will require? And if that's so, uh, who's going to step in? 
And I think that's an important issue. Now, a related issue, which I want, also want an answer to, and you mentioned this in your, I think, in the way ahead, which is very nice. It's sort of, uh, I can see lots of other you know, problems in the way ahead, which you don't touch on, because this is a macroeconomist, financial sector kind of book. But you do touch on the issue of infrastructure finance. And there, you make a very interesting point that you say that, look, ideally infrastructure financing should be done through the bond market. But you more or less say that, look, in the near future, it's just not going to happen because the bond market, pension funds, insurance funds, this, that, and the other, I mean, these are things that take a long time to develop. So they're not going to grow uh, uh, that rapidly. And they're not going to grow that rapidly, actually, because most of it is still public sector insurance companies. And they're quite comfortable lending, uh, borrow, I mean, investing in government securities. So even if you allow them to invest in private sector uh, corporate securities, the chances are they won't do very much. And then you say, therefore, the Indian banks have to play a bigger role. Now, by the way, I completely agree with that. But the implication of that is, that prudential norms of exposure and liability mismatch for Indian banks have to be, and here I'm quoting from Dr. Rangarajan, he didn't use it in this context, but got to do some innovative rethinking. Otherwise, you've got a complete lockdown. I mean, if regulatory, prudential norms and the primacy of regulatory concerns prevent any loosening up on how Indian banks are going to lend long term, and if the bond market cannot really expand because all the insurance and pension funds, you know, that'll take a long time. Uh, then basically, uh, either we say that we we make an exception for private for the banking system for infrastructure somehow defined, or else I don't know how we are going to complete the 12th plan financing infrastructure chapter. Now, since you are also heading a report for us on on lots of these things. Anything you can say uh, uh, about that would be really quite interesting. I think that that's enough of focusing. And there are all these other questions, which I'm sure you want to answer independently anyway. So, Rakesh, we're all waiting. I, was, I, I find it much easier to speak standing up. Uh, <laughs> um, um, what you've done is to uh, increase the length of my talk. So when I see people yawning, I'll stop. Um, let me first start by really um, expressing my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who has made possible the book and this launch. The first, you will see in the book who has really written a lot of the book. And uh, they're not here today, so I want to first recognize them. They were in Mumbai when I had the book launch last week in Mumbai. And that's my former executive assistants and colleagues from the Reserve Bank, uh, Parthar Ray and Munish Kapoor. There are three chapters actually which are co-authored uh, with them because uh, unknown to their bosses, uh, Arvind, you're here, maybe unknown to you, Parthar continued to work for me even though he was supposed to be working for you in the IMF. <laughs> um, so there is a co-authored chapter with him. Uh, similarly, Munish Kapoor continued to continue to work for me even though he was supposed to be working for Shubir Gokaran, my successor at the Reserve Bank. So there are two quarter chapters with him after I left uh, the Reserve Bank. And I have to say that um, in general, actually, um, Dr. Rangarajan is here, Bimal is here, that the amazing sort of devotion and diligence of the Reserve Bank staff in doing a lot of the research, which then goes out under our names. Uh, I tried to correct it as I said, partially after I left the Reserve Bank by actually recognizing my colleagues as co-authors. In fact, actually, almost all the chapters you can say are effectively co-authored by Reserve Bank staff. So I really want to um, make clear that, look, this is really a collective work and even though my name goes on it. Uh, second, of course, let me thank uh, Manzer, the Oxford University Press, uh, for continuing the folly of, cont of uh, publishing my work. This is actually my sixth volume with the OUP. Two of them were OUP New York, and four of them actually have been OUP India. And one of the things I find now that I'm compiling, uh, I've just compiled a reading list for my course on the Indian economy uh, at Yale, which I'll have to be now working on for the next four months, I think 60 to 70 percent of the readings do come from OUP books. Um, you know, and many of the authors, uh, as Manzer said, are actually here. 
So uh, I was uh, encouraging him that he should work harder at marketing our books because he doesn't do a very good job of marketing our books. Um, and he can actually do a much better job of marketing our books. You know, they're not in the airport bookshops. And one of the funny things I find in India is that if street urchins can sell learned books on street corners, surely OUP books should be on airport bookshops. Um, um, and because the world is now such that actually people seem to buy this stuff even at airport bookshops. Um, uh, I would really want to thank Sampriti Pani, the editor of this book. Um, she has really been exceptional in her understanding uh, and patience with the laborious work this book is entailed. When you have the number of tables and so on, uh, as you will find in the book, uh, the editor's job is uh, really very difficult and she has really borne with us because it has gone through, I think the data must have gone through at least half a dozen revisions if not more uh, over the two years in the making of this book and she had to cope with all that. Uh, Natasha, of course, there was her, she's sitting somewhere at the back. Natasha, I think you need to stand up to rec so that everyone recognizes you because she, if you want to write a book in economics, call her. She's the one who actually commissions you. Um, and of course, Rowena uh, Kaparath, who's organized this function, we are dependent on her, of course, for marketing our books. So, uh, Rowena, you have a long way to go uh, to marketing our books uh, further. Uh, so thank you very much. Then, let me thank, uh, uh, actually, Tarun you, Tarun, you are hiding somewhere there. I think you were supposed to be a vote of thanks, so I'm partly doing your work, actually. Uh, but Tarun, first, thank you for uh, sponsoring this function from the Aspen Institute. Um, and from your side, Kiran and uh, your colleague Gulshan, have, Gulshan Bora have been doing all the work. And uh, then uh, Ishar um, Partha Shob agreed uh, very kindly to participate uh, in this function because I thought that without the sort of uh, academic gravitas of ICRIA, I couldn't just have Aspen and Oxford organizing these functions. Now let me come to the subject matter of this book and I hope that I'll cover some of the questions as I go along. First, I do want to make a specific point, which is really what the whole book is about, that it has, in, in among emerging markets themselves and countries as a whole, really, that the, it, we do need to recognize the distinctive achievement of Indian policy, overall macro, fiscal, monetary, um, has been the fostering of growth uh, nine and with financial stability. Even the growth may be much lower for about 30 years and there was financial stability in those years as well. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you feel that wasn't good enough growth, you can have financial stability without very high growth, which is the first 30 years uh, uh, after independence. Um, and the, of course what has happened now is that, you know, if uh, there was a book four years ago, Growth with Financial Stability, I think most of you wouldn't have, got, wouldn't have shown up uh, for, for, for such a book. But financial stability has indeed now obviously come with a much, much sharper focus given what has happened in the North Atlantic financial crisis that has enveloped uh, the advanced economy since late 2008. And I do want to mention here that you need to uh, note the dog that didn't bark in this crisis, which is no emerging market country in Asia or Latin America has had even one significant financial institution in trouble uh, since this crisis. Therefore, just as there was an Asian crisis, this should not be called a global financial crisis, which of course did have global economic effects, it's a North Atlantic financial crisis. And it's because they believe they are the world, they call it the global financial crisis. And uh, I think the some point Dr. Rangarajan made that the difference actually, again you mentioned Canada and Australia, is the difference between I think the lessons learned by the Latin American Asian countries because of their own crises earlier in the 1980s and 1990s is that do have much stronger financial regulation and supervision as do Canada and Australia. The difference between I think Canada and Australia and the other uh, OECD economies has been that they do have much stronger financial regulation and supervision. They are actually willing to use their powers to supervise, uh, which they have been doing. I think that's the, the difference and you are right that they obviously their monetary policy they were both pretty strong inflation targeters, uh, but they had much stronger uh, willingness to do financial regulation and supervision. Um, the, uh, fo the, the fallout of this crisis uh, for the North Atlantic has been really very severe and to my mind we haven't in some sense, um, they haven't in some sense really recognized how serious it has been in terms of repairing things. I mean, the downgrading of US sovereign debt, this is the act itself 
and even I mean more interesting is that uh, SNP has given a further warning that look this is that if you don't shape up there is a, a political uh, uh, decision making system in the United States another downgrade is in the works it's quite amazing because uh, for 70 to 80 years US sovereign debt has been equivalent to risk free debt and if that is not risk free what is where does everyone go actually and so it, it is i think a I think it's, it's a much more historic event than the markets, in fact, are giving credence to. Um, and it's not just the act, it's that, you know, what has happened that's led to this? And I think Dr. Jalan uh, was mentioning this in, in particular. And to the extent, particularly the difference between the United States sovereign issue and the European sovereign issue, that the Europe, Europeans have a real economic problem in getting out of sovereign debt problem, uh, crisis. The United States has a political problem, not an economic problem. The, the economy is strong enough, flexible enough, etc. It's not an economic problem. It's really a political decision-making problem. And that's actually what SNP has said also. And so, Dubai, I think you're very right in, in, in pointing that, look, what's going on? Now, for central banks and financial regulatory systems like, um, this financial crisis ought to be an epoch-changing one. Um, whether it will be, of course, or not, we don't know. There's certainly enough discussion going on. Um, but I do find there's not as much discussion going on in monetary policy as there is on the regulatory supervision uh, system. And I do believe that monetary policy also uh, needs much more discussion. Uh, first, on that issue, the great, the period that was, that was dubbed as the great moderation, the question really is, was it really the great moderation? This is certainly the case. It was characterized by relatively high and stable growth for about 10 years um, and low product price inflation. Um, but if you actually look back, uh, in fact, there was huge financial sector expansion very steep growth in asset prices and much greater volatility in exchange rates during that period. So it's not clear to me that that should be characterized as a great moderation. It was uh, moderate in terms of low inflation with relatively high growth, but there were many other things that were very volatile. Um, then the prevailing monetary policy orthodoxy uh, of inflation targeting or variance thereof and light touch financial regulation was clearly a failure put together. And I think my point of departure uh, in the book and perhaps possibly with Dr. Rangarajan, is that it was really the um, uh, expansive or accommodative monetary policy accompanied by lactose regulation which caused the problem. That is, the, the accommodative monetary policy um, should have been matched by stronger financial regulation, but it was the opposite. And so the two combined produced a crisis, not either one or the other. And I think there's enough written uh, by John Taylor and others, uh, particularly on the excessive expansion of U.S. Uh, monetary policy uh, before, uh, after the uh, dot-com crash and the continuation of that, which then led to very low interest rates, therefore money trying to find uh, higher returns, which led to a lot of the excesses in the financial sector which should have been caught by the financial regulators. So the price of the world is paid for the practice of such narrowly focused monetary policy, inadequate macroeconomic policy coordination, and neglect of financial regulation and supervision has been really immense and we don't know how long this is going to go on because the European situation is very serious to the ex and what is interesting about that is that uh, whereas the the orthodoxy was that the ECB, the European Central Bank will never do bailouts in a sense, that's exactly what they're doing, they're now actually buying Italian and Spanish bonds, uh, government bonds to shore up Italian and, and Spanish uh, bond markets. What I also find interesting is that the new animal that they are uh, in inventing, um, where uh, you'll have a new European organization which would actually do in some sense fiscal action by buying up all these bonds, um, I've been really surprised not seeing commentary on what that does to monetary policy. That is, normally, you know, you only have the central bank which buys this stuff. Now you have another organization which is doing something what the central bank would otherwise be doing. I'm not quite sure what that's going to do to monetary policy. And you sort of, in just because the, the, the European Central Bank um, is, is, um, is, is not supposed to do certain things, you're basically inventing another organization which will do things that otherwise the Central Bank would have done. And I have not seen much commentary on that. And my point sort of is that it's, re this, it's this business of the Central, that what is happening really is Central Banks effectively, or their clones, or some variants thereof, are coming into some fiscal action, effective fiscal action. And I think we haven't thought through this, those things. And therefore, the, 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 the connection between the fiscal and monetary policy really has to be much greater. 
Now, one thing I do want to mention, and this is to do with financial innovation. Um, bear with me for a minute or so. This, the, you know, the distinguishing feature of the decade preceding the crisis was the explosion, there's no other word, explosion, the volume of financial transactions in multiples that were quite unrelated to any changes in the real economy. Uh, even, in the presence of boy, even in the presence of buoyant world growth, economic growth and trade growth. And all this happened without either central banks or financial regulators taking any explicit note of these developments. And what do I mean by that? Um, the, obviously, the complexity and magnitude of these transactions exploded in the past decade. For example, issuance of global credit derivatives increased from zero, zero in 2001. And the world was doing quite well before 2001, by the way, uh, without any such global financial derivatives, uh, global credit derivatives. From zero in 2001 to over 60 trillion, 60 trillion. That is about four times the current US GDP in 2007. Then, of, of course, after that, it collapsed. Um, the forex trading tra activity rose tenfold um, from about $100 dollars uh, um, in 1987 to about a trillion dollars in 2007. It actually doubled in five years, 2002 to 2007. OTC interest rate derivatives grew from around zero in 1987 to about 50 trillion in 1997, 400 trillion in 2007. And these numbers goes be, you know, go over our heads because they don't seem to mean very much. And uh, the global issuance of asset-backed securities went up from 500 billion in 1997 to over, US, uh, over, over to, to 2 trillion in 2007. Similarly, trading in oil futures increased from an equivalent of about 300 million barrels to, in 2005 to a, um, to a billion barrels in 2007, more than 10 times the volume of oil produced. The point of giving those really humongous figures is what were these financial transactions doing for whom apart from making money to financial sector fellows? Did they have any bearing on the real economy? It's not surprising that when they came down, you had trouble. Um, and I do believe there's not enough discussion on this on is addressing the issue, what is the financial innovation for? For whom? What is it doing to the real economy? Um, similarly, this, the explosive growth in securitized credit intermediation and other derivatives, CDOs, that is collateralized debt obligation issues, just tripled in the first, between the first quarter 2005 and 2007. I can go on, I don't want to continue uh, all the numbers there, but the basic point really is that the, uh, the assumptions underlying these developments was that this constituted a mechanism that took risk off the balance sheets of banks, placing a diversified set of investors and thereby serving to reduce banking system risks. The opposite actually happened. So you really have to ask the question, what are these financial innovations for? What are they doing for, for, for anyone's welfare, economic welfare, social welfare or whatever? So what did happen was the financial sector was increasingly separate from the real economy and the question is, you know, what do you do beyond that? I'm not asking that question, but I think that I do, I'm saying this in particular because I do believe that this has not been adequately addressed in the world in terms of what is it supposed to be? We always assume financial innovation is good. What is it for? Um, so I'll stop on that particular issue. The second general issue is the, 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 the mandate of central banks. Um, before the crisis, uh, for almost a decade, decade and a half, there was increasing consensus the central bank should only do uh, price stability monetary policy and of course in, uh, like US Federal Reserve uh, growth thrown in for good measure but there was no agreement that the central bank's uh, mandate should be explicitly expanded from the maintenance of price stability to financial stability and I am delighted to see personally that much of global opinion now has come down unambiguously just about in favor of such an expansion that is mandate of central banks to go from one price stability to also financial stability. Uh, but questions, of course, do remain on how this would actually be done. And, and of course, it's not easy because uh, part of the problem really is the financial stability is much more difficult to define uh, than price stability. And therefore, it's easier, it's not easy also to figure out what instruments to use, when do you actually act, how much do you act, how do you measure whether you've acted well, etc., etc. So it, it is clear it's much more difficult. Um, we have had a proliferation of financial stability reviews, including Reserve Bank in the last couple of years, but they were clearly ineffective in recent in applauding any policy guidance um, uh, through the financial stability reviews for maintaining financial stability. So basically, the central banks 
um, to be effective, uh, one of the issues there is that how do central banks become effective in being in charge of financial stability if they don't have financial regulation and supervision with them? Or arrangements that they have a huge influence in financial regulation and supervision. We clearly gained, I believe, by the Reserve Bank also being regulator and supervisor along with the monetary authority. Uh, the UK is going back to that model after having been the biggest proponent of the separation. So I think that's progress that has taken place. Now on this issue, Bontek, I, I, uh, since you asked, I was not going to touch on the capital account business, but since you raised, I will touch on it. Uh, first, I think what is interesting is that I've been surprised by some of the meetings that I've gone to in the last couple of years on the increasing uh, agreement on some degree of capital account management. Now, I wouldn't go further than that because I believe that you need to talk capital account management rather than capital uh, controls. And of course, capital controls are part of capital account management. On the exchange rate, I think that uh, Surjit didn't say this, didn't utter this word, but he was basically uh, uh, referring to the Chinese exchange rate uh, issue of people not playing by the rules. And given the benefit that they've had, it seems clear to me that others should be, if not following them to the T, because that may not be such a good idea. But it does seem to me that you do need to think about how you manage the exchange rate and not leave it, as people have argued, uh, to complete market forces. One of the issues that I find, I think along with Shankar, uh, among the minority opinion in India, that one of the issues that we do have is a structural issue, uh, which is that you have a huge trade account deficit, merchandise trade account deficit of between 8 and 10 percent of GDP, which is among the highest trade accounts uh, deficits in the world, um, in fact higher than the United States. But of course, because you have around 3.5 percent of GDP coming in through remittances and around similar amount coming in through software exports, what I call unrequited inflows, you are sort of, from a current account point of view, you're about right, about 2, 2.5, 3 percent, something of that order. And so there's a structural issue for us, but how do we manage this? Because you're clearly biased against manufacturing. To my mind, there's no question of that. And the way to look at it really is the merchandise trade deficit, not how fast your merchandise exports are growing. Um, and uh, and the issue of the, of the 12th plan, you are not going to get 8.5, 9% uh, percent growth in the 12th plan and beyond unless you're able to raise manufacturing growth to something like 10% plus from 6, 7% that you've been doing for the last 20 years. And so that's a major issue, I think, that the exchange rate debate has to be framed in that. And apart from Shankar and myself, I think no one else does it. Am I right, Shankar, that we only do? I, I have to write it. I also do it. It's been many, many years. Okay. Yes, <laughs> right. So I think that's a, so, so the, the, this is, it's a brief point that, look, you do need to worry about this. Whether we do more opening, less opening, and so on, there also is an interesting issue. You know, we are more open in the United States in terms of the current account, uh, both inwards and outwards, uh, some is higher as a proportion of GDP than the U.S. I always used to say that Mr. David Mulford, uh, the former U.S. ambassador, should have looked at the data much more before he said that we were closed, because we were open than, than his country, actually, in terms of the actual, and even the capital account, actually. If you sum up the gross flows and compare the United States to the extent data are available, we are not less open in the United States. Yes, of course, we have more controls. But in terms of actual flows, we're not much less open in the United States. So I think that that's, it's more a contextual question in terms of how you manage it. But I do believe you need to manage it. Um, the, um, I'll skip some of the stuff that I have. Um, yeah, I think that one uh, issue, uh, this is really, um, the, if Dr. Rangarajan referred to inflation targeting and that the price stability does have to be an overarching um, objective. Yes, I do agree that for a central bank, price stability has to be something they don't give up. But I think one of the, uh, one, one of the reasons why uh, we've succeeded in India, in the Reserve Bank, is because of the multiple targeting approach that I think, uh, Bimal, is it you who invented the term multiple targeting, multiple indicators? Um, but uh, I think that uh, the Reserve Banks was perhaps regarded as, central, as a maverick in central banking, 
by using the multiple indicators approach, and I do find other people using this term as well now. So whereas I do believe that uh, it's very important that price stability is extremely important, and, I, and, 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 there's, and that in the current context we have to bring down uh, inflation to the kind of level we had for a, about a decade from late 90s to 2007-8, um, that, that remains, but nonetheless, I think that the multiple indicators approach uh, using uh, different means, diff many not not being afraid to use multiple instruments is something we must continue. Uh, we have an exceptional also that we have also regarded the banking regulations revision as an intrinsic part of monetary policy making broadly interpreted and of course we also use many instruments in the monetary policy itself apart from just the interest rate that is the SLR, the MSS, the CRR, the of course doing overall which everyone else does but we have lots of instruments and we should be not we should not be shy of using them and every other central bank is now thinking of using them after what they've uh, gone through and of course we've also used prudential instruments to uh, dampen credit growth in sensitive sectors when it's felt necessary to do so uh, some of those measures then considered unorthodox are now being brought back to the central banking toolkit by even advanced country uh, central banks now on the issue of bank, uh, uh, bank licensing, uh, Montek, that you uh, talked about infrastructure financing and bond market. On bank licensing, um, if you look at, you know, you, I want, once, I think before I left Reserve Bank, I came to your house and delivered to you 10 kilograms worth of reports on the financial, uh, uh, financial stability assessment program, which you unfortunately dismissed because it was done by the Reserve Bank and the Finance Ministry and not by the IMF. Actually, our FSAP is much better in quality and more comprehensive anything IMF has done in any country. So I encourage you to look at that again. You will find in that that we have more competition in banking than most countries. Because the 70% of public sector banks are not a monolith. They compete with each other and with the private sector. I'm not saying 70% is good or bad, but I think you need to look at the results of what, what the kind of policies you have crafted over 20 years, along with Dr. Rangarajan and Dr. Jalan and their successors, that you do need to recognize we have succeeded. You, you look at the progress that has been made, and my, my view on further licensing really is that what you should really do is now progressively privatize the public sector banks, not in one shot, and what I mean privatize is to bring down government holdings to less than 50%. You have enough banks in the system, that is you have something like uh, 20 at public sector banks, something like half a dozen to 10 uh, uh, significant private sector banks. If, say, over the next five years, that is the next in the five, five year plan, uh, your next plan, suppose you privatize, that is, bring down public sector holding to less than 50% in, say, 10 of the 20 public sector banks, you'll have more competitive banking system than almost anywhere else, and hopefully efficient because you'll then release the public sector banks from many of the uh, uh, constraints they, they, they <coughs> operate under. So I think that it's a, it's a it's mistake to the new bank licensing, because there's a whole host of issues of the corporates getting uh, bank licenses. United States, incidentally, has a law which, where non-financial interests cannot own banks. I hope we don't do the folly of allowing non-corporate interests to own banks. The best thing to do, you've got, you've got a system, you privatize the stuff. They have a huge uh, bank uh, branching system and so on. Uh, one of the, the excuses being made for new licenses is to financial inclusion. You can't do financial inclusion without branches. It'll take even even the even ICICI bank, largest private sector bank, doesn't have branches equivalent to any large public sector bank. It'll take ages for any private sector bank to for financial inclusion. So I've also been I've been surprised at how you can pretend you're going to have new bank licenses for financial inclusion, and you would really make progress. That just like after ICICI as a bank is successful, HDFC bank is successful, Access Bank. Some of these banks had public sector ownership to begin with. So I, I would say on this issue, just press for bringing public sector, government ownership, public sector banks to below 50% and they will thrive and get more competition than you want. Um, the, uh, so I think those, those some, I haven't addressed many of the questions. Uh, one, one very specific answer to Kishan Rana Sovereign Wealth Fund, we should have it once we have sovereign wealth. <laughs> As it happens, we have no sovereign wealth. That is, the debt of the country is again, we, we, had, brought down, we, we, we had brought down the debt of the country to less than the reserves. Now, the debt is again beyond our foreign exchange reserves. Uh, as it happens now. And then if you also add to the foreign debt of the country, 
the equity liability that we have, um, you have highly negative sovereign wealth. So once you get some sovereign wealth to the country, please have a sovereign wealth fund. Until then, there's no sovereign wealth to have a fund. So that answer was easy one. Thank you for asking an easy question. Um, let me just uh, conclude. I'm really delighted uh, first that the protagonists of much of the policy making that I've covered, uh, Dr. Rangarajan, Monte, Gimbal are all here. So it's really your work that I've sort of put in words and I hope that I've put in right interpretations to what you've done over the last 20 years. Um, and, and of course, I'm also very happy and privileged that uh, Bimal, your successors, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Subara were there in Mumbai. So you have sort of covered the whole field uh, till now. Um, one thing I would uh, suggest to Dr. Rangarajan, since he's the economic advisor to the Prime Minister, for God's sake, don't give three-year and two-year term to central bank governors. No other respectable country in the world gives less than five years in a shot to central bank governors. So please advise the Prime Minister that in future <laughs> give five to seven year terms to central bank governors. It's just you cannot do good central banking with two and three year terms, including the deputy governors. I had a five year term with Bimal and Shor. Thank you, Bimal. I was quite comfortable for five years. Um, so the I hope that uh, one point I would make in the, uh, the tribute to Dr. Rangarajan, Dr. Jalan, Dr. Reddy, and Dr. Subarao is that we, we have been distinguished in the world of central banking by independent thinking. We have not gone by the herd. And I hope they will continue to not go by the herd, do independent thinking, let them follow us rather than the other, other way around. Let me now uh, conclude on a very personal note. First, just as my last book, Lawrence, which is held in this very room, uh, a little over two years ago. My whole family is here. My brother Vinesh is sitting there. Uh, Peggy is five. Um, sister, last time I missed her because I couldn't see her. This time I was making sure that uh, to make that she's around. Um, um, my father-in-law, Krishan Khanna, he's right here. Uncles, aunts, if I let could all their names will be here forever. Uh, so I've packed the room so that it looks full. <laughs> uh, uncles, aunts, cousins, classmates, and friends. And really, it's their lifelong support that has enabled to whatever I've been able to do. Um, as many of you know, uh, would know, this is a really very special occasion for the whole family with the presence of my daughter, Tarani, here. So optimism, courage, resilience, determination to recover from misfortune have really been a true inspiration for the whole family and for me in particular. Our son Resesh is also here and he's been instrumental in keeping up our spirits along other things. I don't, I don't mean he's supplying us the alcohol, but <laughs> uh, keeping up our spirits even though he was at Yale for most of the year he came back in May. Um, through this order, to keep up this ordeal, and of course, uh, Rasika uh, uh, is really the rock who has kept us together through her courage, fortitude, and devotion of nursing of Tarani, and also, by the way, of you know, coming with me to Stanford, Yale, wherever I go. She doesn't seem to object in uh, coming with me and 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 doing her thing. Um, I uh, would like uh, at this time. Tarani said she wanted to say a few words. So if you permit, uh, I'll ask. Uh, Tarani to say a few words. First of all, congratulations, Papa. And secondly, I want you all to know that my father completed this extraordinary book in the most dire circumstances. Since my accident in October in Uganda, he has been by my side throughout, helping me through my recovery. Despite this, he has been able to devote himself to his professional passion. I applaud him for being there for me through this trying time and for still finishing this pretty astounding book. 
I also really value my father's views about the economy in general because he has the rare mix of being an academician and a practitioner, both very important voices to hear. In conclusion, I want to thank all of you for coming here today and showing him your support. If my father is even half as good a writer as he is a father, then I encourage you all to read his book. And for those of you not interested in economics, you can use this book, even you can use this book as a sleeping aid. <laughs> <laughs> so buy it anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Tarini. That was very moving. I now like to call upon Mr. Tarun Das to give us the vote of thanks, sir. I think that's, that's a very tough act to follow, Tarini. <laughs> you should really have the last word. Um, Rakesh mentioned that uh, you'd kept the spirits up. Actually, the spirits are now waiting outside. <laughs> and I think the sooner we can get everybody out, to, to imbibe uh, the better, I think. Uh, it's been a great function. Uh, it's truly a distinguished audience. And I think it's wonderful that we've had these three thought leaders, for me, you know, who are, as you said, made policy, who have been leaders in this country in many ways, and have assured that we had growth with financial stability. And it's wonderful that uh, Aspen India could join with ICREA. Thank you, Ishar, for your partnership and with OUP in launching this book. Uh, that's it. Outside drinks. Thank you. Thank you.